the traditional. Before introducing our speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional homelands and territories of the local indigenous peoples, including the Osage, Caddo, and Quapaw nations, where the University of Arkansas is currently located. A portion of the Trail of Tears runs through this campus where the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee Creek, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations pass through during a forced removal. By acknowledging the past, we recognize our responsibilities in relation to ongoing settler colonialism that eradicates indigenous peoples, cultures, and languages, as well as those colonial projects that dispossess indigenous lands. This statement is an invitation to recognize the indigenous presence now in our communities and to reckon possible ways to support indigenous survivance. Now, my colleague, Dr. Paulina Camacho Valencia, will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, and welcome everyone. It's so lovely to see all of you here on this rainy Monday, <laughs> if you're in the Northwest Arkansas region. Um, I have the pleasure and the privilege of uh, reading Jessica's biography and offering a really short introduction. Um, Jessica Rosenbaum is an artist and educator who has taught on the south side of Chicago in the Chicago public school system for 11 years. She has an undergraduate degree in painting from Northern Illinois University and a master's of arts in teaching from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and recently became a national board certified teacher. She has spent the last 18 years teaching in a variety of community-based settings while maintaining her own studio practice. She's an active union member and has served as a building level delegate for many years. <clears throat> In addition to being an amazing artist, educator, and union leader, Jessica demonstrates a deep commitment to justice and equity, and this is directly evident and reflected in her curricular design and all the ways she engages with her students and the larger community. I'm lucky to call Jessica a friend and hold me in solidarity. Please help me welcome uh, Jessica Rosenbaum. And as a brief um, housekeeping note, if everyone can please um, mute themselves and turn off their cameras for the duration of Jessica's presentation, we will have time at the end for questions and answer or questions and dialogue. And that's where you are welcome to turn on your camera and engage in discussion. Um, so welcome, Jessica. Hi, thanks for having me. This is, um... You know, this is a really special thing to be able to do, and I'm, you know, sorry, Paulina, but I'm, I'm never gonna get over the, the Dr. Camacho. It's just so cool, and I'm, it's really exciting. <laughs> um, I want to make sure everyone can see my presentation. Okay, we good? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to orient it so I have my notes too. Um, so yes, hi, I'm Jessica. Um, I have been in CPS for a long time. I'm actually a graduate of CPS, uh, the Chicago Public School System. Um, and I am here, I, I struggled with um, the title or what I wanted to call this, this conversation. Um, and, and maybe you'll see why as we go through it. Um, and then I was just gonna say, if there are any questions at any point, um, I will forget to check the chat but maybe somebody can help out with that. Uh, but if there are questions that come up as we're talking, um, you know, I would love, I'd love for you to just drop them in the chat as, as they arise. Um, I can go ahead and monitor the chat and then just really quickly, Jessica, uh, from the viewer end, are we supposed, is it intended that we see your notes? Probably not. So <laughs> I need to figure out how to um, do that so you can't see them. So I'm gonna move them over here. How about now? Gone? Yes. Cool. All right. Um, I'm really, a, I'm a pro at these types of talks, as you can tell. Um, so one thing that um, I like to do with my students, this is, this is something I, I always like to start my year off with, um, something that I like to do throughout the year, because as students get more comfortable with one another, the discussions can get really um, heated. Um, and this is just a really fun <laughs> icebreaker for me. Um, so this was something I started doing when we were teaching remotely. So would you rather have candy corn for teeth or gummy bears for fingernails? And if you want to embellish on that, you can drop it in the chat. I will look at it. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I see it, Paulina. Um, so I know for me, I would rather have candy corn for teeth because I'm one of the uh, few people <laughs> 
who actually enjoys candy corn. Um, plus, I just think they look really uh, vicious and cool. God, oh, man, I might be the only one. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I like candy corn, which means if we ever buy, <laughs> would you? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I suppose it would make it hard, but it just looks really cool. All right, good. Yay, candy corn, team candy corn. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, as a, as a warm up activity with students or when you're uncomfortable in front of a group of people, um, this is always a really fun way um, to start. Yeah, I would think that gummy bears would get really sticky throughout the day, but um, so. As uh, we mentioned earlier, as Paulina mentioned earlier, um, I am a lifelong Chicago resident and a graduate of the Chicago Public Schools. Uh, born and raised in Chicago, I've lived in many different neighborhoods and communities in that time. I now live and teach in the same general community, um, which is something that's really important to me. Um, I like seeing my students when I'm out and around. I like that they, they see me and I see them and we have this sort of, uh, you know, bond in that way. Um, I've taught in a number of different capacities, community-based programs. I worked for the park district here for a long time, um, and I've been in CPS now for 11 years. Uh, I actually started in an elementary school, um, so I taught elementary for four years before uh, moving into the high school position that I'm at now. Um, I teach at John Hancock College Prep High School, um, and I've been there for seven years. Um, so, you know, like my students, I graduated from Chicago Public Schools, and when I went back to get my licensure, there was really no doubt in my mind um, that I would come back to teach in CPS as well. Um, my husband is also a CPS, the Chicago Public School art teacher, um, in the same general neighborhood as well, so that's something that's really important to us. Um, I became national board certified in 2021. Uh, most of my portfolio work for that certification process um, was, do was done during remote teaching and during the pandemic. Um, and some of the things that we're gonna be looking at today um, came from that process. Um, yeah. So um, I've also been a union delegate. My union work and my connection to my union is something that's really, really important to me. Um, these images here are from our strike in 2019. Um, I was helping to print thousands of posters. Um, we painted huge banners. We had a group uh, come down from Milwaukee called the Art Build Workers, um, who helped us prepare all of the visuals that are attached that were attached to the strike. Um, and it was just a really cool thing uh, to be a part of. Um, so John uh, John Hancock College Prep High School is actually is on the southwest side. Um, I put a little a little arrow there so you could sort of get a visual for where it is. I'm sorry, going ahead here. Um, so we are a selective enrollment high school, meaning most of the students that come to our school um, have to take an admissions exam. We offer two career and technical education programs in engineering and law, um, but we also have a cluster program. Um, which is for students who require significantly modified curriculum. Um, we're actually in the second year of being in a brand new building. Um, so I, I tried my best to find um, comparable images. The, the top image there um, was our old building. Very cool old Art Deco building. Um, we're now in a much more modern and sleek looking facility, but um, you know the air conditioning and the heating works. So I think it was a worthwhile shift. Um, the quote that I have up there is actually the mission statement of our school, and I thought it was sort of important um, to, to have that there um, because it speaks to the general ethos, I think, of our students and that they're fairly civically uh, minded and socially engaged, um, and that really is embedded into a lot of what we do at the school. Um, so my school is is on the smaller end of high schools in the city, we have about a thousand students um, and we're considered a magnet school, meaning students can test in from anywhere in the city, um, but the majority of our students come from the communities surrounding the school. So even though it's a magnet school, a selective enrollment school, it very much has a community feel because most of the students live in the neighborhood. Um, like most of the schools in the Chicago public school system, our students are predominantly students of color that come from low income households. Um, oh, and the photos I have there, <laughs> um, those were from a project that I did back in, um, I think 2016 or 2017. 
Um, it was a, a found object sculptural wearable sculpture project in which the students had to sort of imagine a post-apocalyptic future and design armor for themselves to sort of navigate their new terrain. Um, I, I think <laughs> at the time it was a super fun and imaginative unit um, in the years since then. Um, obviously, we've been through uh, some pretty catastrophic global events that I think would shift how I would approach that project now. And you'll see later in the talk actually how I've made that shift to, to teaching the sort of same ideas, but in a different way. So I think maybe this should have been the better title um, for what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and so bringing the mess in. Um, the mess is all the stuff that's happening inside and outside of our classrooms. Um, it's, it's all the stuff that happens in everyday life. It's all the stuff that is the really big events that happen, the really small events that happen um, that affect how we enter into our classroom spaces. Um, so I'm going to sort of move into now like what happens when you open up your curriculum and invite that mess in, um, when you intentionally create space for students to explore like the most current of moments. Um, you know, I think one of the things over the years that have really has really grown with me as I've grown as a teacher is this idea or this realization that that we are we are people within and outside of the space um, and we all carry in with us multitudes of experiences and understandings um, when stuff happens whatever that stuff is good stuff bad stuff normal stuff um, we all have to navigate it collectively um, and that can look different for everyone, um, but I think our classroom, and especially an art classroom, is a really great place to um, unpack a lot of those experiences together. Um, so really this talk is to share some of the things that can happen when you bring in that mess. Um, and I think to be clear, some of the examples I'm going to show you today are like my strong examples. Um, there have been times where I've invited the mess in and have not been able to navigate it as well, um, but I think there are, there are moments of uncertainty all the time. And I think that an art classroom is a really exciting place to unpack that. Um, so one example I will start with is the work I did with students um, post the 2016 presidential election. Um, post election in 2016, there was just a general sense of uncertainty um, that was sort of embedding, embedding itself into everything. Um, students expressed concern, feelings of instability and worry, um, and I felt it too. And at that point, we didn't know what was going to happen or what, what the next few months were going to look like, how the country would shift and what that would mean for us, particularly in Chicago, um, because of the city and, its, uh, and all of its supposed issues had sort of worked its way into a national narrative. Um, at this time, I was also engaged in a professional development program with the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago. And our focus that year was on socially engaged art, um, art that invites in a larger community to experience the art itself. Um, and that served as a really powerful anchor point for me at that point in time. Um, I knew I was going to facilitate some sort of socially engaged project with my students, um, but I sort of had to figure out how to start. Um, so for me, rather than ignoring or or leaving the the issues at the classroom door, um, I was intentionally inviting those complicated conversations into my classroom. Um, so we started talking about what socially engaged art is, um, and collectively as a class, um, we got to work trying to figure out what our what and who our community is. Um, so building on student reflections about current social issues that affect them as individuals, students then sort of expanded their lens to define the qualities of their local community and identify issues that affected many people. Um, we did a lot of mind mapping. I'm, I'm very in <laughs> mind maps. I, I think it's a really good way to just quickly get a lot of ideas down on the paper. Um, so we use mapping to make this complex task more visually clear. Um, so students started off um, in small groups, and then we moved into making this whole group map. Um, so the image there on the right are some of my students um, sort of organically drawing connections between some of the ideas that their classmates had come up with. And, and what we arrived at 
was this idea that my students see something different um, in, in their Chicago, in their home. Um, this was particularly important to my students because, again, as I mentioned, this was sort of around the time that Chicago, I mean, not that it's ever left, I think, bigger conversations um, about cities. Um, but this was around the time that the newly elected president was making threats to send federal officers into Chicago. Um, and my students decided to take, you know, sort of embrace these feelings of uncertainty um, and channel it into creating something that they felt was meaningful. Um, you know, they started asking questions themselves and, and started thinking about all of the things that that were on their mind at this point in time. Um, and so students decided they wanted to do something, create something that would highlight the beauty they see in their city, the power they see in their city, um, and make it so that they could distribute it and share it with people. Um, so the students actually created a coloring book um, based on a number of community organizations in the city that they wanted to highlight. So students were researching different community organizations, um, finding out what their missions were, what their purposes were, how, how people could access their resources. Um, and they created these coloring book illustrations to accompany their research. Um, and then we distributed them. We distributed them to young people um, as a way of highlighting the, the difference they see in their Chicago versus what um, the larger conversation was. Um, the work students made uh, was actually on display at the, at the Museum of Contemporary Art and the students were able to talk to young people, pass their coloring books out. Um, some of my students got to, to attend as representatives of the project um, and we can see some young people there interacting with the coloring books. Um, I was really fortunate because I was able to have them printed through a grant, um, a community service grant through the Chicago Public Schools. Um, and uh, the, the young lady there, Adriana, is now, she actually works in our school now as, as sort of a youth uh, mentor in our restorative justice area. So um, it's been really great to sort of follow her and her path into working in schools and working with young people as well. Um, so I, I put 2020 really big, um, because 2020 was a really big deal. Um, so in many ways, um, some of the experiences I shared with students back in 2016, right, um, again, like kind of coming back to this idea that we were going through these experiences together as, as a collective, um, but sort of navigating that, I think, prepared me as, as best it could for what was then the craziest year, um, which was, you know, school year 2020. Um, for us in Chicago, that year began with a nearly three-week strike, um, actually uh, right around this time uh, in 2019. Um, it was powerful, it was disruptive, and it was exhausting for everyone. Um, but I know for myself, I returned to school feeling, you know, just as a teacher, feeling incredibly empowered and strong and, and thankful to, to have this union and to be a part of this union and that I knew that what we were doing was for the common good and for the benefit of our students. Um, you know, we, we won things like having a nurse in the building, um, in every school building every day um, by the end of our contract. So it was a really big deal. It was a really powerful strike. Um, among other, other wins for the social good, both inside of schools and outside of schools. Um, and that feeling definitely carried on for a while. Um, and eventually, you know, we got back into the rhythm of being in school until March of 2020, when, um, as we all know, everything sort of hit the fan in a way that none of us had ever experienced before. Um, I found myself for the first time in a long time really in a position where I, I didn't know how to I don't want to say console, but I didn't even know how to like approach this with students because I was terrible. I mean, it was scary for us. It was scary for them. It was very uncertain. We didn't know what was going to happen and, and, you know, who knows? And I mean, in many ways, we're still sometimes in that space. Um, overnight, the school shut down and we were sort of in limbo for a few days thinking it might only last a while, um, which we all know now wasn't the case. Um, truly, the end, the last few months of that school year were, were really just about survival um, in every aspect, physical, mental, emotional, 
Um, no one was really sure what to do or how to handle it. Uh, I rushed to plan at home assignments, um, but with no real structure to teach or assess or support. Um, we basically had to wing it uh, for the remainder of the year. So it was, it was, a, it was a while of winging it. Um, and then meanwhile, I had students who were sick, um, parents and students who had to completely shift their lives to work or to take care of their siblings. Um, many of my students became essential workers and were trying to help support their family. Um, it was just really a, a nebulous time and it was almost felt silly to try and do school during that time. Um, so I went, I went back into my classroom archives um, to find a note that I left for my students um, on March 20th, 2020. Um, we must have just gotten the news that we were gonna be closed for several more weeks. Um, and I just tried, you know, I didn't know what to say to students at that point in time. Um, and so I, I did my best to, to give them some at-home work. I shared, <laughs> shared some images of my daughter painting you know, just trying to um, keep that connection with students and make sure that they knew I was there um, and that I was navigating this the same way and we were all trying to figure it out together. Um, so, so much of the pandemic and remote teaching was about making things as normal as possible. Um, and all of those things, you know, kept getting pushed into the conversation when in reality, we were all experiencing something totally new, something none of us had ever experienced before. Um, and so as a teacher, it was like the first time that I felt, I, I just, I felt really lost. Um, you know, as a teacher, we come into the classroom with the benefit of, of lived experience. And that's not diminishing the, the lived experience of our students, but just the, the benefit of time, right? Of having had these years of experiences that can sometimes position you in a in a place where you can sort of see a bigger picture than maybe uh, other people. Um, and like I said, obviously students do as well. You know, some our students can benefit from that experience. But in this particular instance, it it was really I felt very lost. Um, we're sort of forced to navigate a new reality together, um, one which none of us had any experience or background in. So like, what do we do, right? Um, <clears throat> so in retrospect, I'm, I'm sort of able, you know, having had the distance from it to sort of think about the questions that matter to me most at that time. How can I continue to support my students art making while honoring the fact that the world is a really messy place at the moment? What do they need right now? And then how do we, the students and I, navigate this uncertainty as a community and use that experience as a catalyst for art making? Um, so we, we started simply, we didn't know how long this would last or what the next phases of the pandemic would be. Students had access to whatever they could find at home to work with. Some had laptops, some didn't. Some had working internet, some didn't. Um, some students had to work like a lot. Um, and couldn't really engage with school in any sort of real or normal sense. Um, what we, we did what we could as we could do it. Um, I had students looking at and finding artists and artworks that spoke to them. Um, and we engaged in the process of creating something, just anything in response to the artworks that they were looking at um, with what they had on hand. Um, and as, as time and family constraints allowed, again, you know, everyone was sort of thrust into a completely new experience and, and it took some time for that to settle. And again, during this time, I was also navigating, you know, my own reality, which was also challenging. I had my daughter who had just turned two, um, and nowhere to take her. Um, my husband was also trying to figure out how to teach. I was trying to figure out how to teach and keep her entertained and safe. <laughs> Um, and it just didn't feel safe anywhere for anyone. Um, and we were lucky, you know, because we were able to continue working from home. And so we didn't have the added uncertainty of loss of income, at least at that moment. Um, so I tried to really just give students an opportunity to make something if they wanted to, um, as we got through the end of that year. My job was really to create and hold space for students and support them by giving a framework and an opportunity to express that thinking, those fears, that uncertainty, and all the while wondering, you know, wondering what was going to be um, coming next. 
Um, so yes, uh, students spent time virtually visiting the Art Institute of Chicago, if they could, if they could access it, um, to find pieces that spoke to them. I couldn't even really facilitate the activity because at that time we weren't set up for um, remote teaching in any sort of real capacity. Um, students had to find works that interested them and make something on their own with what they had at hand. Um, and that was inspired by the artwork that they investigated. Um, and what came from those works uh, was really powerful. Um, a lot of thinking and, and reflecting on the current state of the world at that point in time. I didn't need to invite the students to do that. I just created a space for them to explore that. Um, so Erica here created this found object sculpture um, with things that she found around her house. Um, she's sharing how her work was inspired by, I mean, and I guess I've even forgotten a little bit. I mean, even at the beginning of the pandemic, there was so much conversation um, about it being real or not real and, and people having different belief systems around the pandemic and around COVID and around um, safety measures and precautions. Um, so Erica here shared in her statement that the mirror represents the people who have different beliefs. The point of my sculpture was to make people see where they stand in this debate. So she she has this mirror at the top of her sculpture. She has um, some Bible verses and then this mask sort of at the base of her sculpture. Um, and so I was really thankful to see these pieces coming in because it, it gave me a conversation point with students. It gave me something to talk to them about and like understand what they were thinking through this very, very strange um, point in time. Um, Vanessa uh, was a student who uh, suddenly had to become a caretaker for her, her younger sister. Um, her parents were still working. She was home um, caring for, for her younger sibling. Um, and so she too created this found object sculpture um, out of her sister's toys. Um, and I thought hers was especially powerful because she was coming from the position of thinking about how to explain a pandemic to a younger child in a way that wasn't terrifying. Um, so she writes here that we're all going through tough times due to COVID and it can be hard to explain to little kids what is happening and why we have to stay home. So for her using these objects, these toys that she found at home to create this, this visual for her siblings was how she was navigating that. Um, <clears throat> so over the summer, no one was really sure what was gonna be happening um, for the following fall. Um, behind the scenes, more structures were uh, being developed to help support remote learning. Um, so when the decision to stay remote through the winter of that following school year came down, schools were better prepared to make the switch. Um, and I think it's important to note that the decision to stay remote through the winter was not arrived at easily by our district. It, it required a lot of pushback from the union and from families and communities who knew that the schools were not ready to be open yet, that they weren't anywhere near as safe as they needed to be um, for our students and our teachers and our families to all be safe. Um, <clears throat> but the politics, I guess, of the pandemic hadn't really changed either. And my school community was still really dealing with a lot of the inequities that were laid bare by the pandemic. Um, students, my students were still, many of them were still working, still caring for siblings, still sort of taking on these different roles in their homes um, than they had previously. Um, so despite the fact that you can see a roster of full students there um, on the on the image on the right, um, a lot of them were logging in from different locations. Some of them were trying to log in for work. Um, and so we just did, we did the best we could do. Um, the image on the left was me prepare, <laughs> preparing um, 150 art kits to go home for students. Um, individually doling out cups of paint. Um, I ended up driving those art kits to different kids' houses, making sure that they had what they needed so that they could engage in a meaningful way in the class. 
Um, I'm looking at that photo now too on the left and I see a bunch of um, ceramic pieces on the shelf that were there um, when school shut down in 2020 earlier. Um, so it's kind of interesting to have these little historical bits. Um, so <clears throat> um, I am an artist too. And sometimes I get fixated on something, a material or a process, or in this case, an object, which will sort of weave itself in and out of my work, my curriculum, um, my life. Um, and so in this case, masks became this, this hyper fixation that I had. And I, you know, not for nothing, it was in every conversation about the pandemic. It was all over the school. It was everywhere. Masks were, were and still are a really big topic of conversation. Um, but re really sort of set me on this path was this uh, little Polaroid of um, my daughter at, at her preschool event outside and, and the kids in their masks and, and seeing her in the forefront there with her mask on and um, really just felt like this dated historical artifact. Um, and so I wanted to use the idea of a mask as sort of a conceptual framework for, for actually, we ended up doing a lot of work around the idea of masks. Um, so I knew there would be a lot to explore there. And as a teacher, I believed it would create conditions for my students to really consider this particular moment in time. Um, our collective experience of the pandemic and mask wearing, um, masks really became the visual symbol of the pandemic in many ways. And, I couldn't ignore that. So that was the mess that I invited into um, my classroom. We looked, uh, my daughter in the mask was not the only inspiration for this work. Um, we looked at a couple of contemporary artists who work with the idea of masks and wearable sculptures. Uh, Cyrus Kabiru uh, is a contemporary artist from Kenya who is known for making wearable sculptures. Um, from discarded materials. His work reflects ideas about transformation um, and change through the ways in which he elevates these found materials. Um, I thought it was a really great, you know, great artwork for our students to look at, for my students to look at, so they understood the evolution of these materials. Uh, Freya Sewell, um, did it not show up? Oh. There they go, sorry. Um, she is uh, an artist and designer based in London and her masks here are from her project called Key Workers. Um, she created face masks, again, from commonplace and found objects um, meant to honor key workers, which I believe is, is what we call essential workers here. Um, the one on the left, that neon one, was meant to represent public safety workers, and the one on the right was to honor medical staff. Um, so I think the masks for me just really represented um, a, a lot of possibilities, um, a lot of avenues for exploration, um, and both their place in historical and contemporary art um, I, was a really nice segue into uh, using the mask as a framework for exploring some new ideas. Um, okay. uh, students had access to some materials through that modest kit that I helped put together for them, um, but they mostly had to rely on things that they could find and materials that they could that they had available at home. Um, so with this project, you know, I knew we were going to be doing some type of face mask, some type of sculptural face mask. Um, there was not one specific skill or, or technique or process that was taught through making these masks. Um, rather, you know, we started with a concept and had a, a sort of expected product, right? They had to make some type of wearable mask. Um, but beyond that, students were invited and encouraged to explore the idea of a mask, what a mask means, what they conceal, what they can reveal. Um, and we were doing this work while the ongoing debate about masking was becoming more difficult and scary and in some cases, unfortunately, um, aggressive. Um, and so what I thought was really exciting was how students were able to arrive at these understandings and these themes in their work. Um, so Sochi's piece here, uh, she called it the colorful side to darkness. Um, 
And so she really wanted to highlight this idea of brightness, that many people would say there's no positive side to the pandemic, but I think differently. I think, or I believe this pandemic has been able to bring more families together. So she was able through her mask to represent this idea that even in these dark moments, there, there are these moments of brightness and she was able to share that. Um, Leslie similarly used a flower theme that sort of came at it from um, a different angle. I, as a side note, I really appreciate my students' commitment to taking good photos and uh, setting their photos up. Leslie put up, um, you know, a little backdrop, a curtain behind herself before she documented her mask. Um, so she was really thinking about resiliency and growth. Um, so as a society, we can continue to be resilient. If everyone were to wear a mask properly and social distance, we can overcome the harsh times we are facing. Um, so she created both a mask and sort of a headpiece to represent those ideas. She's got the little crocheted flowers on the front, um, which I really love. Um, Andrea. Andrea, uh, Andrea is just, she's just a general badass. Um, she's in college now and I miss her. But uh, she really took her mask as an opportunity to unpack just a lot of things that she was feeling. Um, the United States seems like it is in a giant black hole of never ending suffering. Um, she sort of took it a step further to think about power um, and navigating her, her work through that lens. Um, so with that building inside me, I wanted to capture that with the mask. The fist in the middle is very representative of justice right now, and that is why the, it's the centerpiece of the artwork. She also used a lot of recycled materials um, in her mask that she wrote about in a different part of her statement. So combining her interests um, in, in social justice, in environmental justice, um, to create a really powerful piece. Jairo, um, Jairo's mask is one of my favorite ones. Um, he uh, and his family actually relocated to Mexico for a good amount of time um, while we were remote. Um, and so he chose to make his mask uh, with what he had available, which were leaves and uh, stems from the plants around his family's home in Mexico. Uh, Mexico to me is a place full of life, um, not only because of the culture, but also the plant life. Um, and he was able to create this really powerful piece about life and death and time um, through his, his plant mask. So shifting from, from that unit into um, last school year, when we returned to fully in-person school last year, um, I think many of us thought it would be a relief, <laughs> um, maybe a step towards normalcy. And in some ways it was, um, but as the pandemic wore on, I think our responses to it shifted a great deal. Um, there was this overwhelming push to get back to normal. Um, you know, even, even within the schools and in our planning and our curriculum, um, we were talking a lot about, you know, social emotional support and making sure our students um, were, were taken care of in that way, but there was also this other side of, you know, they're back, we're back in school, everything's normal. Um, and that was a really, that was really challenging thing to navigate. Um, so we still had, you know, simultaneous remote instruction happening for students who are on quarantine. Uh, masks were still required in school until about the middle of that school year when it became optional. Um, note, this was not because it was any safer. Um, there were forces in the state that were filing lawsuits against uh, school districts that had mask mandates. And I think um, the Chicago public school system saw that one was coming their way. So they shifted to a mask optional model. Um, in January of that school year, um, our union undertook a remote only work action during the height of the Omicron spread. Um, so we, we did not go into the buildings for, for five days um, and offered to do remote instruction despite our uh, board not allowing us to. Um, but we believe that action really kept a lot of people from getting very, very sick. Um, so that was sort of the background of that school year. It was definitely a challenging year. 
in some ways more challenging than the remote school year. Um, so this was a unit that I did actually with my beginning students. Um, we were exploring value, but through exploring value, I think so much about our own <laughs> our own values sort of came came forward and came through it. Um, I could have had them take their masks off for their for their photos. We did these from photo references, um, but that seemed like it would have been a really big missed op opportunity. This was actually kind of a, a, a lively debate that I had with my coworker, with the other art teacher um, that I work with at my school, um, who was pretty insistent that they were missing out on drawing some really essential parts of the face, right? The nose and the mouth. Um, what, but to me, this is where like my shift in thinking, I think really uh, came to the forefront, you know, because what mattered most was, was it more important for the students to learn how to draw a nose and a mouth? Um, or was it more important for them to have the, an opportunity to express something about themselves that might have otherwise gone, excuse me, <clears throat> might have otherwise gone unseen? Um, so by using the mask as sort of a symbolic extension of themselves, students had an opportunity to really use their self-portrait drawing as something more than, than an exercise. Um, and it's it's interesting because even reading through their statements and their reflections after they finished this piece, um, even their their shift and thinking about the mask sort of changed a little bit. Um, whereas in the earlier projects, um, COVID was sort of at the forefront of the the concepts behind a lot of their work. Um, these students sort of shifted into using the mask more as an exploration of identity. Um, concealing and revealing. Um, so I've got a couple of examples here and some student statements to go along with it. Um, in many ways, I feel like these pieces aren't necessarily even about the mask itself anymore, but rather the idea of masking um, and how we can sort of hide or reveal different elements of ourselves. Um, so Andres here, uh, with his incredible drawing style and, and envious of it, um, really focused on how he wanted something imperfect. He wanted to make something imperfect. Um, he really wanted to explore texture. He wanted to create visual contrast between the drawing he put on his mask and the textures that he built in his face and in his hair. Um, and he used that contrast in the mark making styles as sort of a way to describe himself. Uh, he wrote random and not perfect, but still. Um, Daisy, um, Daisy's is very powerful as well. Um, she chose not to, to alter her mask, but rather alter the entirety of her composition. Um, I would title my artwork, No Repairs, because it can seem impossible to look at yourself in a different way and in a different light. Kevin. Um, I really liked Kevin's um, explanation as well. Um, I wanted it to be as if the audience could not tell whether I was smiling or not under my mask. I wanted to make it seem like I was exploring my own paths, whether good or bad, but that I in that portrait was finding new opportunities. And so he did a uh, packing tape transfer. So with magazines and packing tape, he created um, this collage mask that sat on top of his face. So um, <laughs> uh, sort of where I arrived at through um, through these images and, and what I was thinking about and what I would hope to communicate to you all, it is hard to um, bring in deeply challenging pro uh, topics into the curriculum. Um, and like I tell my students, it's like, it's okay for things to be hard. Um, and it's okay for us to feel uncomfortable and uncertain. I think that oftentimes teachers, I mean, maybe it's just me. I, I feel the need to, you know, I want to know exactly in my mind what my steps are going to be, where we're going to end up, what it's going to look like, how we're going to do it so that I can anticipate what my students are going to need from me. Um, but in reality, that's not always how. That's just, it's not a sustainable way of, of working and 
doesn't allow to allow us to bring in these moments that are really um, perfect opportunities for deeper thinking. Um, so I know that this won't be the last time my students and I have to navigate something tenuous. Um, and so I feel better prepared to create those types of conditions for them to, um, to explore it. Um, and my friend's mask here right there, uh, based on getting many, many COVID tests back in the day. Um, and that's about all I have. Um, I have my email address there. I'm happy to share resources um, and answer any questions. Burr, 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 burr. That's my <laughs> I was like, oh no, plotting. have I not been talking this whole time? <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, at this point, we invite folks to, if you want, you can turn on your cameras and we can engage. If you have any questions, um, you are welcome to ask questions. Um, I did see one question in the chat box um, early in your presentation, and um, the question. Um, was if you wouldn't mind explaining a little bit of the process around uh, mind mapping, I believe. Yes, sure. Can you please explain uh, the mind mapping process a little bit further. Yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so basically um, what I had students do and what I've had them do in the past is, is come up with like a central idea or a central word or theme or image and then they start to sort of um, kind of spontaneously respond to those words. So um, in this case, as we were working on our We See Something Different project, you know, we were thinking about our communities, um, both inside of the school and outside of the school, um, and how, how we can find those connections. So this table here started with the idea of like wanting to express an idea about unity. So what are the barriers to unity? What are the things we have in place that help us feel unified? Um, so you can see branching off of unity there. We have communities, Chicago, families, schools. Um, but then what are what are the barriers to unity, right? We've got racism, people feel superior, sexism. Um, and so it helps students to just sort of visually break down these really complex ideas. Um, and then what I did, from what I can remember, <laughs> is and what I've done in the past is from their tables then we kind of create a collective mind map together so I started in the center there with community and so based on some of the ideas they had generated in their small groups we threw it up onto a bigger mind map and then students sort of came up and used tape to to connect ideas together um and then <clears throat> You can, uh, this was my pano shot that didn't come out super great. Um, but what we arrived at both by using the map and through conversation was um, this idea of creating a counter argument, right? What is going right and how do we highlight those things that are going right? Does that, did that help? Yeah, can you just say how the kids use the map like for the next step? So yeah, so what we did was, um, like I said, when we moved from <clears throat> the small group to like the whole group map, I was sort of up there writing and following along with them. And through just verbal conversation, as we were talking about all the different aspects of their mind map, we were able to sort of synthesize it into this idea of creating a counter argument, right? Um, through these conversations, through the mapping process, the students really started just ex expressing how frustrated they were um, by the sort of conversation around their home, around Chicago, around their city. Um, we've got great Chicago pride here in Chicago. And so um, it was something that as I started thinking about this idea of community and being socially engaged through that conversation, through that process, we sort of arrived at this idea of creating a counter, a counter narrative. Thank you. There's another uh, question in the chat. When discussing personal or potentially divisive subject matter, 
How did you deal with disagreement between students and keep shared dialogue respectful, especially with teenagers? <laughs> um, I, I think the way, I, I mean, my students, I think at this point, really, I, I don't hide my my beliefs well. I'm not a politically neutral person. Um, I don't think teaching in the sh in public schools um, you should be a neutral person. I think teaching is a an act that is is political in nature in general. Um, but I think if you'll notice throughout the discussion about the artwork itself at no point was it okay well we have to wear masks it's the only thing we can do it's the only thing that's gonna you know covid this i i wasn't telling them how to think about the masks they were there we we used it as an opportunity um i didn't you know tell them one way or the other how they should feel about the mask um it was rather more of a framework or an idea with which to address those ideas and it sort of just came up naturally like their responses came up organically um without me having to to tell them one way or the other what they should think about it thank you yeah are there other questions from um, anyone hanging out who has a burning pressing question they want to ask Oh, I see Lucero's hand went up. Okay, go for it. Okay. <laughs> sorry. It, it, was it for me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't find the raise your hand button. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, during the presentation, you were talking about the moment where uh, other uh, faculty that you're working with were like drawing on the on the idea that they should be drawing. Um, noses ah. mouths right and it's wondering like how do you deal with the instance where the thing that you're exploring is really how people are seeing not just like the way that you present yourself in terms of drawing and realistically depicting what it is that you're seeing in front of you but also realistically depicting what it is that you're going through mm -hmm. and so like how do you construct that battle when it seems that most of the curriculum that in, is involved in, you know, grade school education is is typically due to the proximity of how you can draw realistically, mm -hmm. right? And how, how do you expand that? In, I mean, in, in it, yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. And it, so it, I'm just, I, my cowork and I are different teachers. We come we come to our school and in our classrooms with different experiences and different backgrounds. Um, he is um, very much a you know foundations. Uh, this is how you draw. This is the right way. This is the wrong way, sort of thing. And it's it's a little old school. Um, <clears throat> whereas I see you know, even a gridded self-portrait assignment, I'd like to see it as an opportunity for going beyond just like learning how to render things mm -hmm. realistically. Um, and I think that's okay, um, especially in a, in a department small like mine. Um, a lot of the students who do a lot of the art classes kind of weave in and out of our two, like our different course loads. I do predominantly 3D classes. I teach art one, I teach sculpture, I teach ceramics. He teaches drawing and painting um, and then our AP classes. So we like to think of it as sort of a balancing act where if students are getting classes from both of us, they are getting kind of a well, you, they're getting stuff from both sides, right? And it's not that I'm not teaching kids how to draw and it's not that he's not teaching kids how to work with ideas. We just come at it from a different way. Um, and I think our ultimate goal is to, to release well-rounded artists into the world um and if they draw a nose one year and a mask the other year then that's then that's how we do it um, but as job. as always like i invite anyone who has and it's it's never been an issue but you know my first response to anybody would be come into my classroom then and tell, tell me they're not learning something come on in thank you jessica yeah we have time, I think, for one more question. If there's anyone else in the audience who has 
a burning question they need to just ask now, go for it. Um, otherwise I can ask a question, but I also like to fill the space. I'm gonna pause for a second in case others have thoughts. Okay, that was five seconds. Um, <laughs> you can also email okay, yeah. Jessica if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of building on the question that, that came previously, but it seems like as much as you can in your curricular structure, you really make an, in, uh, an intentional effort um, to think about making as an opportunity to unpack, right? The social and political terrain mm -hmm. um, that your students, that based on your students' lived experience. Um, and you also mentioned, you see this work as a framework or as an opening for students to express like uncertainty. How, what does that look like and how does that translate to perhaps like um, again, like a formal kind of school setting where perhaps you are still um, beholden to perhaps like a rubric structure and like a project structure. Where do you find that tension and the balance between like choice and assessment, right? And uh, lived experience versus like and conceptual exploration um, versus again, more of the like need to kind of show and make and where then are the, where is the pliability or the ferocity of like what making and learning looks like? Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I think that this is one of those times that I am just going to stay, state how thankful I am for all of its problems and for all of its issues that I am very thankful to be teaching in, in the Chicago public school system because I think over the years and my time in CPS, there has been an intentional shift into um, being responsive to student need and, and making sure that what we're teaching is um, responsive and reflective of our students. And I think that at my school in particular, that that is work we have been very intentional about engaging in. And so I think for me, um, this is good practice because I have a pre-observation conference tomorrow so I can talk about this stuff, so I'm all set. Um, you know, I really try and honor my students' lived experiences while teaching them this you know art skills right like it is a vocabulary it is a practice it is something you can learn um and then having these tools and the ability to connect those tools right the drawing with value or using paper mache or building something out of clay as well as the background and the framework and how to develop and conceptualize an idea makes them stronger artists i don't know if that answered your question um, you know, I, I try to make my rubrics as authentic to what we're doing as possible. Um, I'm not going to assess them on whether or not they were creative enough. Um, that's why we, I, that's why I was able to share so many student reflections, um, because I, we reflect a lot. And so that's really having that time to read through their reflections and see the connections they're making between process and product. Um, I think is how I'm able to assess their learning better. Thank you so, so, so much for joining us today, for sharing all of your wonderful and beautiful work. And thank, thank you for you. all of you thank in you the for audience me. for joining today. Yay, Jessica. <laughs>